Same seminar series, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we've had a, a lot of good. Mm -hmm. Dave Patterson, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. our first kickoff. Oh, wow. Uh, mm -hmm. We had John Rabai. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, John Yeah, we've had a good, uh, good lineup. We're happy to have you. Yeah. It's interesting, Jan LeCoud and I were both invited to talk in this uh, sort of pro and con about neuromorphic architecture. So Jan and I were the two cons, and of course there were two pros. And I thought Jan and I just made absolutely convincing arguments that this spiking stuff was for the birds. Um, and, but of course this was at a forum where everybody attending was, you know, a neuromorphic researcher. So when they polled people for who do you think made their points best, it was the other guys. <laughs> that means you mean like hard hardware. Yeah. When you say neuromorphic architecture, you mean like right. This is hardware, hardware where neurons. Well, no, it's hardware where you represent. Um, the data, um, the way analog. bio, no, it's not even analog, it's spiking. spiking. So it's yeah. narrowly targeted just for spiking. Neuromorphic. Right, so it's usually spiking plus analog, right? So yeah. you, have, yeah, yeah. you have the spiking and then you have sort of a, um, a you know, junction where the spikes get turned into some action potential and, and then when it receives a threshold, it fires and causes another spike. Well, it is a more hardware or algorithm? Yeah, yes, but what I pointed out is that on the hardware side, it's way less energy efficient than just doing it in digital. And, and um, really? Oh, way less, yes. Yeah. Wait a minute, so two voltages coming into a, a, some kind of a summing junction is, takes more energy than multiplying 16 bit? Uh, well, if you, want the same, if you want the same degree of accuracy, yes. Yeah, and, and so, so we, we wrote a paper about this in DAC. And what we pointed out is that the, the operation, if you're doing stuff in analog, is very inexpensive, right? You can sum by just running these currents together, yeah. first approximation, that's free. The problem is, it's, it's never about doing the operation, right? It's about the whole system, which involves data movement and storage. And all of these analog systems wind up using A to D converters to convert to digital to do the movement and storage. And when you look at, um, when, when you look at there's, there's these, um, I think it's an empirical law, but it's a pretty widely held law about for so many bits of precision, how much energy does it take to do the A to D conversion? It sort of puts a bound that you're never going to do better than about 10 teraops per watt on an analog system. Um, if, and, and to, if you have to do the A to D conversion intermediately, not just on the output, the input and the output. Mm -hmm. then I can, you have to do it sort of every layer of the network for most uh, neural network. And, and so the, the best of breed analog neural networks is this company called Mythic in Austin. And they're five, and they're five teraops per watt. And they're gone now, they're, they're now a myth. <laughs> so they they went under. Um, they went under. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It's not competitive. Yeah, yeah. And they were the best. There were a lot of people. And there were a lot of people who were worse than them. Oh yeah, no, because because it sounds really cool, but when you dig into the numbers, it doesn't work. 
I always felt the main the main trade off was probably uh, was more efficient. Mm -hmm. But if you have a hardwired network, you know, in digital, then you, you know any new um, uh, architectures and algorithms mm -hmm. that come along are easily adaptable. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is hardwired. Well, you know, the, the, the basic primitive operation is the same, right? They typically do a matrix vector multiply right. as their primitive operation, right, and that's typically that, well, doing that's digital as well. Oh. Being well, we, we hardwire the matrix, matrix multiply as well, so I can't spot them, I can't yeah, criticize them for that. Okay. We, we, can, we can write a lot of code around it, but we still have the same primitive operation. <coughs> <laughs> True Berkeley time, very not very approximate very Berkeley very time. Okay, well, it's roughly Berkeley time at this point. <laughs> great, great to see everyone. Good to see you here. Welcome to uh, the EEX uh, colloquium series. I'm Sophia Shaw. I'm a faculty member here. It's our great honor to have uh, Bill Daddy, the chief scientist and senior vice president of research from NVIDIA. Bill was also a faculty member uh, at Stanford. He also served as a department chair of the computer science department. Bill has done a lot of very impressive technical work across the hardware software boundary. He has done a lot of innovation, interesting hardware designs from compute all the way to interconnect. He has a long list of distinguished owners. And to me, Bill is always a very, a real Renaissance man. He actually understands a lot of er very different areas very deeply, has a lot of expertise. He's one of the very few people I can think of that can give keynote talks across different areas, from circuit design, design automation, computer architecture, all the way to machine learning. And to me, it was also really fun uh, working with Bill. Uh, back when I was at NVIDIA, I learned a lot of things from Bill and uh, his, uh, his thinking and uh, 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 sh really shaped the way I think about hardware. So with that, Bill is going to share with us uh, some of the trends in deep learning hardware. And uh, Bill, take it away. Okay, thank you, Sophia. Um, my pleasure being here. Um, it's always fun to visit uh, Berkeley. Um, so let me start with some motivation. Um, so it, it turns out that there's sort of three main ingredients um, to deep learning. And you know, many, many of you will realize that sort of the AI revolution happened several times, just that the first couple times it didn't catch. There was you know, perceptrons in the 1960s and then you know, revolution ar around, um, mostly around expert systems in the 80s. But the time AI really took off was, was really within the last you know, 10 or 15 years with this new resurgence in, in deep learning. And it was really fueled by three things. Um, the first is um, the algorithms and models, as sort of as I'm indicating here with this schematic from the AlexNet paper. But those have been around since the 1980s. Um, um, deep neural networks, convolutional networks, training them with backpropagation and stochastic gradient descent. Um, I can put you to papers 80s or earlier for all of those concepts. Um, I actually took a course on deep neural networks um, when I was a graduate student at Caltech in 1984 and I built you know, various things that could recognize single digits and things like that. Um, but some things were, were still missing. The next ingredient to be supplied was data sets large enough to train these models. But these were around, by the early 2000s, there was a Pascal data set and then later um, Fei Fei Li put together the ImageNet data set. And you had large label data sets that were big enough to train reasonable models. The final ingredient, if you like to think of this as sort of you know, fuel and air, the spark that ignited them and really caused the current AI revolution, was hardware fast enough to train a large enough model in a reasonable amount of time and a large enough amount of data. You know, for AlexNet, that was you know, training the AlexNet model on the ImageNet data set in two weeks. Um, that was really when GPUs sort of came onto the scene and provided the missing ingredient of hardware fast enough to make this technology that had been around since the 80s or earlier real. Um, since that point in time, if you think of that point in time as AlexNet as the uh, left point on this chart, um, hardware has been pacing the technology. People are building larger data sets, they're building larger models, um, and in many ways th they were limited by the hardware they could run on, on the size of the model they could train and, and the amount of data. And this went on, on a rate of, you know, order of a factor of 100 over three years for the vision models. And then when the large language models took off, the slope changed. 
and it wound up being sort of an order of magnitude per year increase in total training time. You can think of this as, you know, petaflops uh, per petaflop days of, of GPU time to train these large models. And if I were to put on some of the of the more recent um, sort of you know diffusion-based models, the you know DALI and ImageN, and we have one at, at NVIDIA um, called Edify. Um, they would just continue that line up into the right. That that projection is is continuing as people run even larger models, doing you know some pretty amazing things where you can give a description and get out an image of you know a dog riding a bicycle if that's what you want an image of. Um, so um, how do we you know we feel a real responsibility in the hardware industry to continue delivering this you know sort of order magnitude increase in performance um, you know over relatively short periods of time so as not to limit the creativity of the uh, AI researchers. Um, and it's particularly hard to do in the absence of Moore's Law. Um, so let me give you a little bit of history. And, and one way to, to couch this is to look at the inference performance of, of our NVIDIA GPUs over the last decade. So sort of from um, 2012 with Kepler um, to uh, 2022 with Hopper. And over the last decade, we've delivered a 1,000x improvement um, in inference performance. And, and maybe 2.5x of that comes from process technology. The different colors here um, code the, the process nodes with uh, Kepler and, and Maxwell in, in 28 nanometers. Um, you know, Pascal, Volta, and um, Turing were in 16, um, and Ampere then is in 7, and Hopper is in 5. Um, but but you know, going from 28 to 5 is maybe a 2.5x improvement in, in, in energy efficiency. Um, I, I'll go into a little bit more detail on, on sort of what they did, but what I put up here is, is the, uh, the number representations um, and, and the, the innovations that happened. So, you know, when we started training deep neural networks with Kepler, um, they, the GPUs were not designed for this. What they were designed to do is computer graphics. And the data representation you want for computer graphics is 32-bit floating point. So the, the instruction everybody used was 32-bit FMA, floating fuse multiply add. And, um, and, and that was kind of what you were stuck with. It's overkill, um, you know, using a 32-bit. And by the way, the energy of the multiply, which is the expensive part of this, goes quadratically with the number of bits. So the cost of 32-bit versus 8-bit is not four times as much, it's 16 times as much. And around you know, 2017 at, at ISCA, um, Dave Patterson published this paper about the Google TPU, um, which happened to be uh, about 16 times more energy efficient than Kepler, which is what he compared it to. And almost that entire um, efficiency was due to the fact that they were doing int 8 and we were doing FP32. It was not about the specialization. Um, specialization does come into the picture, though. Um, around the Pascal generation is the first generation where we started designing these things to do deep learning. We realized that for deep learning training, FP16 was sufficient, and so we introduced the FP16 data type. Um, and we also introduced a, a dot product instruction, the half precision uh, dot product four, which would take four um, you know, FP16 numbers, four FP16 numbers, pointwise multiply them and sum them into an FP32 sum. Um, the, uh, the real jump forward came in our voltage generation where we introduced what we called our tensor cores. And what we realized is that um, you know, a, a deep learning accelerator is, is two things, a matrix multiply unit and a lot of software. Um, one of those two could be you know, evening assignment for a hardware design class, right? which is the matrix multiplier unit. The other one is quite hard. So we just threw the matrix multiplier unit in um, and exposed it as an instruction. Um, in Volta, we introduced the HMMA instruction that's half precision matrix multiply accumulated. It takes two um, four by four FP16 matrices, um, multiplies them together, and sums the result into an FP32 matrix. Um, for inference, we, um, in the next generation, the Turing generation, we introduced the integer version of that, the IMMA, um, that got us up to, these are the number of, of, uh, of, of ops peak. Um, in Ampere, uh, we introduced structured sparsity. And I'll talk a little bit more about sparsity. It's been kind of a, a quest of mine, but, but you know, you know, kind of like people searching for the Holy Grail, it's very hard to actually make sparsity work. Work meaning give you an actual improvement in, in you know, performance per watt. Um, but the thing that does work is the two out of four sparsity that's, that's in Ampere. Um, and then in Hopper, we basically um, you know, bumped up the total performance up to four teraops, uh, excuse me, four petaops, and, um, um, and uh, introduced a uh, FP8 in addition to the intake. So let me walk through some of the things um, along this path. Um, to, to start, we, let me start with the endpoint, and then we'll, we'll see how we got here. Um, so Hopper is a pretty, um, a pretty cool chip. It's got a lot of neat things in it. Um, a petaflop of, of um, what we call TensorFlow 32, which is really a 19-bit format, but it's sort of the, um, 
the exponent from FP32 and the mantissa from FP16. Um, so it has the 8-bit eight, eight exponent um, and a 10-bit mantissa and a sine bit and fits into a 32-bit container. It wound up being the format that was needed to get enough um, combined dynamic range and precision to train essentially every model. We could do most of them with FP16 or Bfloat16, but some required the, the TF32. Um, it has um, one or two petaflops, depending on whether you're dense or sparse, of either of the 16-bit formats. We support both. And two or four petaflops of either of the 8-bit formats, either floating or intake. Um, it has three terabytes per second of HBM memory. Uh, the HBM memories are these uh, chips that are stacked on the interposer with the GPU die. Everybody always looks at these inductors, which are part of the power supply, and thinks those are the, the memory chips. Um, the, the inductors are very important because this chip uh, consumes 700 watts um, at about 0.7 volts. So there's 1,000 amps of current um, flowing in here. And, and actually, the design of the power supply is a real uh, tour de force. If you just figure out trying to get a kiloamp of current um, you know, through the minimum amount of copper you have there without an enormous amount of losses is, uh, is an interesting exercise. Um, a couple other neat um, things. One thing which makes the FP8 work well is something called a transformer engine, which is a little box that sits by the SM and analyzes the matrices as they go by to figure out what precision you need to represent them. And so it allows you to run modern transformer models, as in you know, large language models, um, mostly at FP8. And when you need the FP16, it kind of shifts gear and will change the representation to the larger range when it's needed. Basically, we'll scan the matrix and decide um, which representation to use. And then something I'm particularly proud of, because it was uh, you know, my proposal to get it in, were some dynamic programming instructions. And it's something I'll come to toward the end of the talk about sort of um, accelerators in general. GPUs are really a platform into which to plug accelerators. And at the time, I was very interested in bi uh, bioinformatics a lot of which is dominated by doing dynamic programming using the Smith-Waterman algorithm. And so I introduced a couple instructions that are in Hopper um, that basically make that orders of magnitude faster than running on a conventional um, GPU or, or CPU. Um, so a figure of merit I'll come back to in a couple times in this talk is teraops per watt for inference. And so Hopper, the end point of that GPU chart is nine teraops per watt. Um, you know, we were just talking about the, the best in breed analog um, deep learning um, accelerators got to five. Um, I will present some data later um, from a paper we published in the VLSI Circuit Symposium early this year. That's a completely digital accelerator that's 96 teraops per watt. Call it 100 if you um, round up a little bit. Um, so um, again, here's sort of the, um, where the gains come from. And um, I'll spend a little bit of time on all of these. Um, first of all, number representation, um, going from FP8 to any of the 8-bit um, formats basically gave us a factor of 16 of this um, 1,000. Um, we got a lot by going to complex instructions, and I'll actually show this on the next slide. The cost, even on a GPU, which has a very simple pipeline of you know, uh, fetching, decoding um, the instruction, fetching the operands from registers, putting the result back in registers, is about 20 times the cost of doing a typical primitive operation, like, like, like a... Uh, um, an int eight or, or um, add or multiply. And so if you, do, if you have to do all that work and just do one operation, um, you're, you're never going to be more than 5% efficient, right? So what you want to do is you want to amortize a lot of operations around the cost of doing one instruction. And so that's why doing complex instructions like dot product in Pascal and then moving on to the matrix multiply accumulate instructions basically amortizes out the cost of the instruction overhead and makes a programmable engine as efficient as an accelerator. Um, basically, the overhead now of being programmable is a couple percent, not, you know, not 20x. And then we did get something from process, but um, it, it is less than linear with gate length. It's more, it's more like linear with metal pitch, and the metal pitch did not scale as fast as these numbers might um, suggest. So it's really about a 2.5x gain um, from process over these. Um, so let me uh, start with talking about instruction um, complexity. So in... Uh, the uh, generation where we had um, half precision floating multiply accumulate, you do a single instruction that takes about 1.5 picojoules. I've normalized all these, by the way, to a 45 nanometer process, since these were in, in different process technologies. Um, in this process, fetching, decoding the instruction and doing the operand fetch and store is about 30 picojoules. So our overhead is about 20x. We're spending 20 times as much energy um, sort of figuring out what to do as doing it. Um, even with the dot product instruction, where we're doing four of these operations, um, we still have a 5x overhead. Um, it isn't until we, we wind up doing, um, I think it's like you know, 128 operations in order of 512 operations, 
that we get the overhead down into the 15 to 20 percent range. And at that point, we're essentially as efficient as a dedicated accelerator. Um, as I said before, an accelerator is a matrix multiply unit and a bunch of software. We now have the matrix multiply unit um, and a place to put the software. Um, another thing which really didn't show up in my chart, but it's one of the ways we've been able to scale, especially that very steep slope of supporting all the large language models that have wanted orders of magnitude improvement um, in performance, is you know, that 1,000x over 10 years was the performance of a single GPU. Over that same period of time, the typical training um, ensemble, for big models at least, has gone from being one or a couple GPUs, as in the case of Alex, that was two Keplers, um, to um, things on the order of 4,000 GPUs. This is a DGX SuperPod, um, and basically it's a supercomputer. You know, if you write a big enough check, you can order it, we'll deliver it, you plug it in, and it works, which, by the way, is quite unusual. It used to be you, know, you would sort of have to build your own supercomputer from components, and it would be order of you know, many months from the time you plugged it in to when it worked. We deliver it completely configured with the, uh, with the Mellanox networking and, and each of these gold fronted boxes here, five per rack, is a, uh, is a DGX box which has eight hoppers in it um, along with a bunch of our NV switches to build a um, you know, small connected GPU. It basically that's eight times as big as a, as a single hopper and then those are connected together by the InfiniBand on the Mellanox network. And this basically accounts for sort of three orders of magnitude of going up that, um, getting the petaflop days you need to train big language models is going from a couple GPUs to a couple thousand GPUs. Um, but it's a card we can only play once, but we've played it. Um, let me talk a little bit about the software that goes along with the matrix multiplier. Um, our, our view of the software stack is we start, um, and we have a bunch of hardware products, we start on top of that with um, sort of you know, three basic um, software platforms. Um, our RTX, which is our graphics platform, does ray tracing. Um, CUDA, which basically is our, our general programming system and physics for physical modeling. So we, when we build your virtual worlds in our omniverse platform, you know, when you, you know, throw a ball against you know, a block, the, the appropriate dynamics occur and the block gets knocked over and the ball bounces and, and the like. Um, on top of these, um, we built various vertical platforms. Um, Modulus, which applies AI to doing physics simulations. Um, if, uh, you know, uh, one of the <coughs> platforms within Modulus is called ForecastNet, does weather forecasting essentially to the level of precision of the best numerical models. Um, Clara is the medical applications of that, Reva for speech, Maxine for video conferencing, Nemo for question answering, Merlin for recommendation systems, and then there, there are a bunch of other verticals here, Drive is an autonomous vehicle platform, Metropolis for smart cities, and so on. And so there's a complete vertical software stack, starting with the programming system, you know, building on, on you know, AI building blocks like, like QDNN, and then ultimately with, with complete verticals in, in different areas. Um, and the software is hugely important. Um, one way this shows up is if you look at the ML perf results um, over time. Um, this basically is, is from about a generation back in ML perf, but it, it made a nice point. Um, these, um, these gray bars are both V100. And what you see happened is that um, on a given benchmark, the performance on the same GPU went up 5x over a relatively short um, period in time. And this is basically because, you know, when you um, you know, first bring these models out, um, you map them to the, to the platform and you find out you're not using your matrix multiplier as often as you think you should be. You profile it, you modify the code, and you basically get the duty factor of the matrix <coughs> multiplier up uh, and do a lot better. And so over time, even on the same hardware, these models get faster. Um, here's a more recent one. This is um, showing H100, which, which is uh, just beginning to ship now, um, which is 6.7x you know, faster than the previous generation on Ampere. But Ampere is two and a half times faster than it used to be, again, because the software improves over time. Um, and so it takes a huge amount of effort. Um, again, you, you get a couple of graduate students write the RTL code for that matrix multiplier in an evening. Um, it takes thousands of people, lots of time, to write all the software needed to actually get good results out of it. Um, I always find that the HPC wire is a good place to, uh, to track the trends in, in, in the MLPerf. Um, benchmarks. We, by the way, I've been using that name. How many people here have heard of MLPerf before? Okay, at least a few. Okay, so MLPerf is, is a uh, um, independent body that basically benchmarks AI. Um, I should say benchmarks machine learning um, hardware. And it does this by presenting a bunch of different models that you need to run. And they have an open division and a closed division and whether your hardware is currently shipping or not shipping. Um, and, and the most recent ones, which came, just came out, um, quite recently, that November 9 headline is just a couple weeks ago, um, 
is you know, for the MLPerf 2.1 um, benchmarks, which just came out. Um, and uh, that, that's a training benchmark. And again, um, you know, we basically swept all the, all the uh, benchmarks. Um, Qualcomm has started to show up. These last two headlines, you know, NVIDIA and Qualcomm shine. We don't like other people shining. That's not good. Um, <laughs> and uh, other people make an appearance. What's interesting is that we, we actually have a tracker um, that tracks something on the order of 120 um, deep learning hardware startups. Um, and, and some enormous amount of venture capital money has gone into this area in the last few years. And I can guarantee you all 120 are not going to make it. Um, in fact, actually, a lot of the 120 have already closed their doors. Um, it's, it's starting to happen with uh, the current economic downturn. A lot of uh, investors are losing their patience and, and kind of pulling the plug on many of these ventures. And, and I see lots of resumes starting to cross my desk. But, but one, one way to see why the, the uh, startups are having trouble is they've all built their matrix multiplier. Uh, but a lot of them haven't invested enough in the software to be competitive. And that's, that's really the, um, the hard part of the game. Um, let me talk, to, talk a little bit about sort of you know, where we started out talking about that 1,000x trend um, over 10 years. And a lot of it came from number representation. Um, so, so on a number of different occasions, I sat back and asked, if you could you know, start with a clean sheet of paper, what is the correct number representation to use in a deep learning accelerator, just, or just for a deep learning calculation, whether you did an accelerator or not. And so there's two things you want to worry about. One is cost. Um, and if it wasn't for cost, you'd use FP64 for everything, right? Um, but you don't, because that's expensive. Um, you, you, it's a lot of energy, and it's a lot of um, you know, operation um, to do. Um, and the other is accuracy. So what you'd like to do is use the least cost thing that gives you the most accuracy possible. And the cost really has two um, aspects to it. Um, you have to store the value and transport it, and those costs are just directly proportional to the number of bits, right? So 8 bits is 8 bits, whether it's FP8 or int8 or an 8-bit symbol. Um, but the multiply accumulate, um, the cost of this varies a lot depending on what those 8 bits are. And, and in fact, for a while, I was very enamored with um, using symbols, basically building a code book. So if I have 8 bits, right, I can choose 256 symbols, and I can put them anywhere on the number line I want, right? So if I have to do something like integers, then I space them evenly on the number line. Or if I do float, I do you know, evenly, and then the spacing changes, and I get another even spacing, another even spacing, and so on. But if I can use symbols, I can put those values exactly where I want to represent um, the, the things that I, that I need to represent. It is, you know, if you're doing a scalar representation, it is provably the most efficient way to do it in terms of number of bits. The problem is that this box gets really expensive. And I'll talk about that when I go through our history of building accelerators, because we built one that did that. Um, I'm particularly enamored with log number systems, and I'll talk a little bit about more those later. Um, floating point is a nice compromise between log and integer, and integer has the property of being simple, uh, but it has really bad dynamic range and error characteristics. And so um, the, the, the cost of movement is um, the number of bits. Um, oh, I should say t t the two things down here before I, I leave this. Um, I often get invited to uh, speak at these neuromorphic conferences. I don't know why they invite me, because they know what I'm going to say. Um, it, it's a bad idea, right? We don't build airplanes by putting feathers on them and making them flap their wings. So just because biological systems do it doesn't mean it's the right way to build artificial systems. Um, spiking is almost the most expensive way of transmitting a value um, if you're doing it in digital electronics because you know, what burns energy in a CMOS system is toggling a line. And you know, if I'm, if I'm going to have n bits, I'd like to at least weight those bits so that, so that I can represent, say, 256 values with 8 bits. But if I want to represent 256 values with the spiking system, I have to spike between 1 and 256 times, on average 128 times, and that just burns gobs of energy. It's a, it's a horribly inefficient way of doing business. Um, analog, it, when you f first start looking at it, appears to be a really efficient way of doing business, because after all, adding is free. Take two currents on, on wires, so, you know, connect them together, and you sum them, that's summing. Um, you can do multiplies by using a, a resistor. Think of that as a conductance. You, you apply a, a voltage to the conductance and you get a proportional um, current. The problem is the operation is, is only part of, of the issue, right? But the operation part is great for analog. The storage and transport part becomes really problematic and becomes very expensive. Most people resort to doing an A to D conversion um, to do the storage and transport. And if you look at the um, values, and I have a, I have an, it's not in my main talk, but I have a backup slide that shows this, um, you wind up having trouble doing better than about 5 or 10 teraflops per watt um, analog if you want to get 8-bit level precision um, for, for your results. Anyway, so let's talk about um, 
the other part of it, which is if I have this representation, the two things I need are dynamic range, how big a range of numbers can I cover, and precision, what is the maximum error between two of the values I'm representing. Or another way to think about it is, if I have a value somewhere on, on the line, what is the biggest error, you know, wh where's the worst place to put that value so that I get the maximum error to a number that I can actually represent with the <coughs> system. Um, and so log is great, you know, and I should have put log 8 and FP16 to compare it because log 8 is actually slightly better than FP16. But with twice as many bits, of course, you get, you know, a lot more dynamic range um, and, a, you know, a lot smaller. Remember, the errors are getting smaller as they go to the right, so right, going to the right is better. Um, int is really bad in that it doesn't have very much dynamic range. Compared to int 8 to log 8, you get sort of, you know, not quite two orders of magnitude dynamic range, and um, you get, um, you know, compared to four orders of magnitude for the log, and you get worst case error that's really quite bad. The worst case error is between, um, you know, one and two, right? One and a half has an error which is, you know, 33% um, compared to uh, what I can otherwise represent. Um, we can also do um, scalar and vector uh, representation. So let me start with some scalar symbol representation. Oops, what did I just do there? Ah. Okay. Um, and, and this is a, uh, you know, a, a figure from our, um, our ICML paper um, on compressing neural networks. And what we showed is, you know, what's great about um, training neural networks with stochastic gradient descent is you can backprop that into anything you want, including the symbol table of um, representable values. And so, uh, we, we came up with a way of uh, basically taking our code book, initializing it to something like everything uniformly distributed, and then th there's a couple tricks here that have to do with, with sort of k-means clustering. Um, but over time, you can basically train what your symbols are. And so you basically start with uniformly distributed symbols, and then they, they basically learn to be under the parts where you are, you know, have a high density function of, of weights and activations. Um, now, here we have a bimodal um, distribution of weights and activations. So, I should say the blue curve here, this is um, weight values, um, and this is the density. So, we have a lot of weight values you know, here and here, none at zero. This is because this was a prune network. We took anything that was near zero and basically clipped it out of the network. Um, and so, you, you, you wind up with left as this bimodal distribution. Um, and so, we trained our weight values, and they're really nicely sampling you know, where, where interesting things are happening. And we're not wasting too many um, symbols. Um, on outliers, whereas if you use the standard integer representation, this is with 16 um, samples, um, you wind up wasting half of your code book out here where nothing interesting is happening. Um, and I'll, I'll talk later about a less expensive way of dealing with the same um, problem, which actually works way better because it doesn't have the operation expense problem that the code book does. But this was a, was a great way of showing that we could wind up getting by with a couple fewer bits than people thought you could get by with for a given level of accuracy by using the you know, number of symbols you get from that number of bits in the most effective way. And it you know, was you know, almost like provably optimal the most effective way by using training to train what those values were. Isn't it the case that this kind of stuff would be uh, basically impossible to do on an analog uh, neuromorphic or, or am I missing? Um, yeah, I mean, you, 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 you can't represent these intermediate points because ultimately, and, but this is also why it's impractical to do even digitally. The problem is if I really want to place these here, it means to do the operations, I have to decode my code book into a very high precision representation. Otherwise, I don't get to place them so accurately. And then the operations become prohibitively expensive. And that's what actually killed this idea. Um, but there would be no way to do it in, in, in the neuromorphic way. Um, if, you're, if you aren't pruning your network, your distributions tend to look like this. But that idea works just as well. You just see the little you know, red dots clustering under here and basically putting each symbol where it does the most good. Um, but I'll explain a little bit later why this is, in fact, a bad idea. Um, it was good for a couple of publications. Um, yeah. one, one of my current favorite um, representations is, is the log representation. I like to think of representations in terms of their value function, which means given the bits, in this case, S, E, I, and E, F, um, the value here is minus 1 to the S, so S is the sign bit, 2 raised to the power E, I dot E, F, right? So E, F is a fractional part of that exponent. E, I is the integer part of the exponent. Um, you really need that fractional part because if you just had log with the integer part, um, it's too coarse a representation. Just, it, you know, just powers of 2 is too big a spacing. So what we found is, is things like the, uh, the 4.3 representation here works pretty well, but that means that your spacing between numbers is 2 to the 1 8 um, is, is, is the difference between each number and the next number. And each one is spaced exactly that much. 
So if you take this, this log 4.3 representation, you know, on the I side, you can represent numbers up to 15. So you can represent things up to 2 to the 15th, right? That's you know, 30, 32K. Um, so you have a dynamic range of, of order of 10 to the 5th. Um, and on the um, accuracy side, that spacing of 1 to the next at 2 to the 1 8 is about you know, um, 1.04. So you wind up with a 4%, um, excuse me, 1.08. So, so the, mi the middle is where you get the maximum error. It's about a 4% it's about a maximum error. Um, if you take the same 8 bits and you, you represent it with int 8, now you can represent up to you know, plus or minus 127, right? So you get 10 squared instead of 10 to the fifth. And your worst case accuracy is 33%, right? That's the difference between 1.5 and, and either 1 or 2 when you uh, round up or round down. Um, it, it's good to visualize this on the number line. Um, so um, here's the 4-bit log representation. Uh, and what I'm doing here is I'm plotting for each actual value, what is the closest representable value in the number system? And what you see is, down here where numbers are small, your spacing is really small, and so your error is small. Proportionally, it's the same. It's, it's going to be, for the 8-bit, it was 4%. This is a 4-bit representation, so it's a little bit less. Next year is 9%, um, which is a little bit more. And the problem with integer is that the spacing is the same everywhere. Um, and so you have really small errors out at the hot big numbers, but you have really large errors for the small numbers. And if we go back a couple slides, what you'll re remember is that um, these things are, are sort of normally distributed around zero. And most of your numbers are really small numbers, and the errors are really big, right? So that's why, why the integer representations tend to, they, they tend to waste bits. It's not that they're bad. Um, they're, they're super simple, which is a nice attribute. But it takes more bits of integer to accurately represent something than it does bits of log. Um, so the, the neat thing about log numbers is that doing multiplies, and remember multiplies are the thing that are expensive, is really cheap. You take two log numbers, you, um, you know, XOR their sign bits, and you add the rest of the bits together. So multiplies turn into adds, adds are super, super cheap. Um, that's great. The problem comes that then ultimately you need to add things up too, because remember that what we're typically doing in deep learning is big dot products, right? We need to you know, multiply a bunch of numbers and then sum them all up. Um, and, and adds are hard, right? The conven conventional way to do an add in the log representation is you have to convert to integer, which, by the way, the, uh, I, the I bits of the log are easy, right? That's just a shift. But the um, F bits of the log is a table lookup. That's the easiest way to do it, is just look up in a table, shift it, and then, and then you're there. Um, and then you do the add and you convert back. Is that super expensive because, you know, the, the several steps and, and it winds up making um, log not look good. But the neat thing is imagine I'm summing um, 10,000 numbers, which is not unusual for one layer of a neural network to compute one result. Um, and, and what I can do is I can say, let me factor out this um, lookup part um, and um, do it at the end, right? So say I'm, I'm doing um, the, uh, the 4.3 log representation. There are eight possibilities for the thing I'm going to do the table lookup on, right? So what I do is I simply say, for everybody where the F part is zero, we're going to sum you guys all together. At the end, we're going to do one table lookup multiply by that. For, for all the ones that are one, we do the same. One table lookup and, and, and look on that. That was worth a patent. Um, so uh, this is the key figure out of that patent. And, and again, what you do is you take, um, you, you multiply these things together, and then you're adding them all up. And you basically take the quotient component, which is the I part, and you basically are going to shift um, one, so you have a, a, a number with a single one hot, um, you're going to shift it across by the quotient, and then you're going to put it into an accumulator um, depending on which of the, um, the F bits are. So there's going to be eight of these accumulators, in this case um, N is eight here. Um, and only when you're done do you look up two to the zero, two to the one eighth, da, 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 up to two to the seven eighth, do one multiply by that, and, and you're done. So the, um, the ad winds up being very cheap as well, as long as you're doing a lot of ads and you can amortize out um, that table lookup. It turned out that um, making the energy that's come out um, well was dominated by the energy of these accumulators, because you typically will build an accumulator out of a bunch of flip-flops, and, and these wind up being you know, like 24 or 32 bits to sum these results, and we'd be clocking all 24 or 32 bits, even though we're summing a number into them with a single bit set. Um, and if you think about it, and, and you're accumulating, if you have a number with a single bit set, on average, two bits flip, right? The number you hit, and then on average, um, you know, half the time the next bit flips, and half the time the one after that flips, and so on. 
So an average two bits flip. And so the right way to do this is with an asynchronous accumulator. So you basically toggle the bit and then let it ripple down the other bits. Um, so you only pay the toggling um, for the ones you use. It turns out clocking a flip-flop, even if it doesn't change, is a super exp energetically expensive operation. It's roughly the same energy per bit as an add. Um, now, I, I said earlier that um, the great thing about training the scalars um, was that we could get sort of you know, more, more precision out of a given number of bits, but it was super expensive because we ultimately had to change it back into a high precision representation. So we asked ourselves, was there a way to get the same result um, without um, you know, having to have a high precision representation anywhere? And the answer turned out to be optimal clipping. And this is um, you know, work of a uh, most, most work of guy in NVIDIA Research um, who uh, um, you know, did, did all the analysis and, and uh, a lot of nice theory around this. But what you realize happens is that if you have a range of numbers that say range from minus 0.8 to 0.8, um, but there are only a few outliers out here. If I represent the whole range, um, I wind up with no what's called clipping noise, and basically un inability to represent a larger or small value because it's outside my range, but a lot of quantization noise because the gaps between these, especially where all the interesting stuff is happening here, are super big. So I can turn a knob and say, what if I just decide I'm going to clip out these outliers and, and I'm going to you know, round them all down to this value? Um, then I'm going to introduce clipping noise on those values, but in exchange I get a smaller error on these values here because the quantization noise gets smaller. So, so the question I actually posed to Charbel, the guy who did a lot of this work, was what is the minimum mean squared error? Um, you know, what point on turning this knob do you get the minimum mean squared error by trading off clipping noise and quantization noise? And I didn't think this was possible to do in closed form, but he comes back like the next day with all these equations. And, and says, oh, this is, you know, you can just solve this integral and, and come up with it. Um, and it turns out solving the integral is computationally kind of expensive, but there's an easier way of, of kind of approximating it, which works nearly as well. And what you see is for different um, layers of a neural network, depending on whether you're 4-bit, 6-bit, or 8-bit representation, you start out um, with the uh, clipping scale at zero, which means you're not clipping anything. So you have all, um, all quantization error. And then as you come down here, you get less and less quantization error. Your clipping error is going up, but it doesn't really matter very much because there aren't very many values you're clipping until you reach a point where essentially the clipping error and the quantization error are the same. And at that point in time, your error starts going back up again as your clipping error starts to dominate and the quantization error becomes less important. And so for each of these representations, there's an optimal clipping scalar. And, and you basically pick that clipping scalar and clip to that number. And that basically then gives you the, um, the minimum mean squared error. And, and actually, empirically, it gives you the minimum um, error for that number of bits. Um, and this, this actually doesn't show, these are the results, but it doesn't show the thing that, that, that really you want to compare, because these are all using the clipping. What you really want to do is compare the clipping to the not clipping. And what you'll see is it lets you get by with about two fewer bits with the same degree of accuracy. And what we're doing is the same thing we were doing by training those code books. We're jamming all the values into the interesting part of the computation but we're doing it without having to then do the you know, table lookup into a high precision representation. We still have a low precision representation and the arithmetic is still very cheap. Um, yeah, so I'm not gonna try to walk through big tables and numbers here. Um, okay, um, the, the next thing to realize is that um, you can get a certain, everything I've talked about so far is coding a single waiter activation with, with one representation. You get a certain distance with that. You can actually go a lot further if you start to code groups of numbers together. Um, and so one thing we could do is say, um, let's scale. Remember that clipping thing. We're basically producing a scale factor to take whatever range of numbers we have and land them on the distribution of, of weights or activations that we have to land on. Um, and historically, we've done this layer by layer. We had a different scale factor for each layer of our neural network. Um, one thing we, re we realized is that um, the, there's a huge distribution of values over, over a layer. And if you have to pick a single scale factor for the whole layer, you're making a huge compromise. And it's actually not that expensive to maintain separate scale factors for relatively small vectors. And, and in this work, we basically typically used a, a vector length of 32 or 64. So for every 32 or 64 weights or activations, we would scan those values, find the biggest and the smallest, we would apply our optimum clipping factor to it, um, and then we would basically take the scale factor 
for just that um, vector. And, and um, we would basically take that scale factor uh, and the scale factor for the activations, multiply them together, and then weight the whole thing by that so that <coughs> the, uh, the result comes out here. Um, to give you a picture of what this is doing is um, this, you know, this blue, you know, sort of normal curve here is kind of the distribution of, of values over the whole layer of the neural network. Over a, a, a vector of, say, 64 elements, um, we have a much narrower distribution. Imagine there's actually a smaller normal curve under here. Um, and so if we can, for each vector, squish this in, we wind up getting much less quantization noise. And again, we can play the optimum clipping game on top of this, but we're doing it per vector, not per layer. Um, and so, um, you know, ultimately, we scale the, um, you know, um, the weights, you imagine it's M by K weight matrix, and the activations is M by K activation matrix. And so we have two scale factors we're multiplying together, um, one for the weights, one for the activations. Um, in doing this. And this also gives us another bit or two of effective precision. So let me shift gears from number representation to accelerators. And I'm going to talk about accelerators in kind of a um, historic perspective. Um, I'm going to walk you through, um, this is just sort of the headline slide, a bunch of accelerators that um, we've uh, been involved with in, in NVIDIA research. Um, and, but before I do that, let me talk a little bit about accelerators in general. And I'll refer you to a, a paper I wrote in CACM a couple years ago on, on domain-specific accelerators. And there I actually analyzed a bunch of accelerators for different types of problems and, and asked, you know, why, why, why are accelerators good? Why do they give you better performance per watt than running things in a general purpose computer? And the first, of course, is that they're specialized. You can come up with, you know, a special data type and a special operation. And for deep learning, these data types have been the number represent, representations I'm talking about. For other accelerators, for example, for bioinformatics, um, your data types are things like a base pair, right? You want to be able to represent one of four values very efficiently and do computations like distance computations on what is the cost of substituting one for the other um, very quickly. And, and you know, for, for, the, for the deep learning, you know, it's typical arithmetic. For things like the uh, bioinformatics, you can basically do this distance computation. You can, in fact, do a whole Smith-Waterman step, which is you know, what the instruction in Hopper does, and do in one cycle what would normally take many tens of cycles um, to do. And so there's a big efficiency gain with that. Um, the next thing that you can do with an accelerator is just have a lot of parallelism. And what you'll see is in all the deep learning accelerators, people have multiple matrix multiply units, and typical dimensions of them are 32 by 32. Some, some get larger, up to 64 by 64. So you're doing many thousands of operations in parallel. The parallelism here means 1,000x you know, or 10,000x. It doesn't mean 16x. Um, probably one of the most important things is to optimize the memory. Because if you take any sort of standard benchmark, and you were to say, okay, here's the key operation here. I'm going to you know, accelerate that with some magic hardware. Um, and that goes to zero. Um, a lot of benchmarks will speed up like maybe 2x, if you're lucky, because they're memory limited. They're, they're basically going to you know, fetch the same things from memory they would have before and, and not do any better. So for example, in the bioinformatics accelerator, it was really critical um, to take the two key um, things that, that used a lot of memory bandwidth, one of which was the traceback pointers for the dynamic programming, um, and the other of which were the, um, the, the bins to count um, seeds during the seeding operation um, and basically build specialized memories for those that could sustain much higher bandwidth than you could do out of using the main memory system for that. Um, and that, that really gets to the optimized um, memory. Um, and then where, where a lot of accelerators really win is just getting rid of that 10x, uh, 10,000x overhead of a typical processor. And I'll, I'll uh, point that out a little bit later. Um, one thing we find in a lot of our accelerator projects um, is that if you take the old algorithm and try to accelerate it, it doesn't get much faster because that algorithm was tuned and has highly evolved over years to match the cost characteristics of a conventional CPU. And so you often have to make trade-offs. And the great example of this is in our bioinformatics accelerator. Uh, we found that um, most people were spending a lot of time on the seeding stage because doing dynamic programming on a conventional CPU is super expensive. And if instead you basically did spend a lot less time in the seeding stage, which gives you way more false positives, going into the dynamic programming, but you made dynamic programming blindingly fast. You just did way better. Um, and again, you have, you have to basically revisit the algorithms and, and co-design them to the new cost function. Um, so I've been building fast accelerators since 1985. I won't bother going through these all. Um, but you know, I started out actually building simulation engines because um, I was a, a logic designer and I didn't like to wait for my simulations to run. And I found I could make them run thousands of times faster by building um, simulation engines. Actually, the one I built at Bell Labs 
um, wound up with a life of its own. After I went off to be a professor at MIT, turns out a guy inherited this project and revved it through four generations of, of um, semiconductor technology because it was the, the mainstay of, of all the chip design um, done at Bell Labs and Western Electric for a long period of time. Uh, we then went on to do you know, graphics and uh, deep learning and uh, bioinformatics and uh, that solvers and so on. Anyway, probably the biggest gain you get in an accelerator is getting rid of unnecessary um, you know, organization. As somebody who sort of has a natural aversion to you know, bureaucracy and organization, to me this is just a generally a good thing to do. You know, this is like a factory where there's like one guy doing work, this little 16-bit integer adder. Um, and there's a huge bureaucracy of managers and marketing people trying to figure out what work they should be doing. That's a CPU, right? Um, and, and so this is actually a relatively efficient out-of-order core. It's a, a, a refer to this uh, 2015 paper um, where somebody took an ARM A15 core, um, which is relatively simple compared to, you know, a, the, the, the aggressive ARM cores like the ones in our grace chip are way worse than this. Um, and, and it actually is, in this case, almost exactly 10,000 to 1. It's, um, 32 femtojoules for the 16-bit integer ad, 250 picojoules um, to interpret the instruction. So you get rid of that. Um, and so now we're not going to interpret instructions, we're just going to do the operations. Um, then you have to know how much each operation costs. So this is a, a table from uh, a paper Mark Horowitz had at ISSCC a number of years back. Um, and this is like 45 nanometer numbers, but proportionally they're still about right. And what you see is that math is actually pretty cheap. The, remember, this is a log scale here, right? Um, and in fact, low precision add is really cheap. You know, doing an 8-bit add is, you know, 3 picojoules. And even, you know, the 8-bit multiply is only, you know, 200, um, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, it's uh, three fem 30 femtojoules. Even the 8-bit um, multiply is only 200 femtojoules. Um, it's, it's when you need to, like, put it in memory that you start getting into the uh, uh, picojoules. And, and if you, by the way, if you have to go off chip, it's, you know, all getting into the nanojoule range. <coughs> so moving things is expensive. Um, I like to sort of quantify that by this order of magnitude um, you know, chart, which is if I can keep something you know, local to the arithmetic, it's order of you know, you know, um, sub-picojoule, right? If I can just feed it from one arithmetic unit to another arithmetic unit, or maybe through some flip-flops. If I have to go to a local SRAM, it's an order of magnitude more expensive. So say forwarding around locally is sort of 500 femtojoules. Going to the local SRAM now is five picojoules. Um, this is for a 32-bit word. Um, if I have to go to a global on-chip SRAM, it's now 50 picojoules. And by the way, that's not RAM, right? That, that, this SRAM and this SRAM are the same SRAM, right? All these SRAMs are built out of like, you know, 8K byte subarrays. Um, this is 5 picojoules of reading the SRAM and 45 picojoules of getting the address there and the data back, right? It's, it's really a communication cost. Um, and if I have to go off-chip, it's even higher, and that's all communication cost. So there's, there's a huge uh, benefit to locality. Um, for deep learning, and, and I'll talk a little bit about this, the other um, thing which has been, um, to me, one of these most frustrating um, things I've worked on is sparsity. So it turns out that these networks are inherently sparse. This is a, uh, a paper that Song Han and I had at uh, NeurIPS in 2015, where we basically showed you could take your typical neural network, and if it was a fully connected network, you could lop out 90% of the connections, and for most convolutional networks, you could lap out 70% of the connections without any loss of accuracy. Um, we, you know, we, we basically thought we'd invented something, we went back and looked at the literature, and of course, like most things on the uh, algorithm side of this, the original paper was like back in the 1980s that you could do this. Um, uh, but you know, we kind of, kind of rediscovered it, and everybody got very excited about pruning networks until we started to try to figure out how to run them. Um, and, and I remember we wrote the original um, that original NeurIPS paper, one of the reviewers said, of course, this is of academic interest only because operating on, everybody knows operating on sparse matrices is only efficient when your density levels get below a tenth of a percent. And that's actually the conventional wisdom for running the sparse matrix package in most numerical libraries. Um, but I said, you know, gee, we ought to be able to do better than that. We're hardware engineers after all. We can build hardware that, that does this. And so uh, Song and I built this thing called the Efficient Inference Engine. Um, and it's basically for compressed, fully connected layers. Um, and what we did is we basically took the, um, the, the, the sort of pointer walking stuff that would make the sparse matrix uh, package expensive. Um, I'm going to have to accelerate a little bit. Um, and and we, we factored that out into special purpose hardware. We had special purpose memories to hold the pointers for the, for the compressed sparse column format. Um, and uh, you know, and um, basically it worked really efficiently um, compared to a scalar unit. So the problem is a scalar unit is not the right way to build a deep learning accelerator. 
um, you, you get the economy of scale when you're doing, you know, not a single multiply add as, as this was doing, um, but if you're doing, you know, a 32 by 32 matrix <coughs> multiply a single unit and doing that full 1024 accumulation combinationally without having to incur flip-flops. I'm going to accelerate through here because I want to get to the end. Um, I don't know, do I get the end on Berkeley Standard Time too? Probably. Um, so um, then uh, Joel Emmer at NVIDIA Research working with Vivian Z at MIT uh, built IRIS. What IRIS really did is experiment with, with what I would call tiling or data flows. Basically how to take the nested loops of deep learning and optimally map them in a way that minimizes your communication and maximizes reuse. Um, and, and they introduced con concepts like you know, weight stationary data flows and row stationary data flows. Um, I was still in pursuit of, of sparsity um, so, you know, with a bunch of, of uh, collaborators at NVIDIA, we, we did this thing called the sparse convolutional neural network where we decided, okay, we need to have a big multiplier array to get that economy of scale. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of um, sparse weights and sparse activations, and after all, every weight hits every activation. We're just going to throw them all into this big multiplier array, and we're going to throw their coordinates into a parallel array. So what comes out needs to be added into different values. And, the coordinate computation tells you where to put it. So this did, did an operation that I call scatter add. We actually had a supercomputing paper back in 2005 where we introduced a scatter add operation. This wound up being a really bad idea because we took the irregularity of the sparsity and we moved it all to the output side of the equation where you have the most bits, right? You'll typically have an 8-bit weight and 8-bit activation, but you'll sum to, you know, 24 or 32 bits. So it's going to be four times as expensive to do the, um, to do the irregularity there. And that, that wound up... Um, you know, barely breaking even, essentially. I mean, if you look at this, this was doing it dense, doing it with SCNN, and then this is doing it dense and just zero gating, right? So the energy efficiency you gain by doing it dense and just not paying energy when, when one of the two operands was zero. Um, we, we built this thing called um, Simbo, which is kind of a neat um, exercise in packaging, but, but mostly techniques that I described in the previous ones. Um, so when we talk about the last couple, we, we had a, um, this was a paper we had at ICAD in 2019. A, uh, um, Excel room we built called Magnet, where what we did is we basically built a, um, a generator for accelerators, and we turned the generator loose to do design space exploration to try to find the you know, most efficient combination of sizes of the weight buffer and input buffer um, and um, you know, you know, number of ve vector lanes and number of, of, vec of elements per vector, and you know, search that space and wound up coming up with a system that I think this hit about um, 20 teraflops uh, per watt. And then just recently at um, the latest VLSI symposium, um, we had the, the follow-on to that. We called this magnetic BERT. We'd, we'd evolved magnet, which is aimed mostly at convolutional neural networks, to doing transformer networks. And, and then we also added a bunch of the optimizations that I described previously, including the VS quant, but not the octave. Um, so um, we basically um, saturated the partial sums at 24 bits rather than doing a full 32. Our um, scale factors, we rounded to eight. Um, this is just a lot of compromises that reduced the energy but didn't change the results at all. Um, we increased the size of our vectors to 64, and we used four-bit uh, precision. We actually, this was fabricated um, on, in a little corner of a recent um, um, product chip. Uh, they had some spare areas. So we actually fabricated these, and we fabricated both int 8 and int 4 data paths. But the, uh, the you know, performance results were really from the int 4. Um, so I'm looking at a different, okay, let me see, let's back in here, okay, um, yeah, and then um, another thing, we, this is, you know, almost an aside, but there's a soft max that happens in um, the layers of, of a transformer network that's expensive to do because it involves doing exponents um, of E, right, it turns out that if you do exponents of 2 instead of E, you get essentially the same result, we had a paper called softer max uh, that kind of describes that. Um, so this is sort of the layout of, of that. Um, I'm going to walk through some of this pretty quickly. So here are the results. And the, the big point is that um, with 4-bit and applying the vector um, quantization, the vector scale factors, we essentially get the same error as running BERT base on 8-bits. Um, but if you run 4-bit without um, doing that scale factor, your, your accuracy just goes completely to, to the wind. So um, th this basically shows how we're able to get um, <coughs> Um, it's, it's sort of in this case a uh, 2.3x energy gain by going to fewer bits by basically using this vector scaling uh, to use those bits more efficiently. Um, these are the requisite um, energy numbers, energy breakdown. Um, 
so you, we worked really hard to get 50% of the energy in the map. That's what the data path is here. Um, the rest of this is a combination of um, accessing the buffers, the um, A and B buffers are the uh, activation of weight buffers, and doing the accumulator. Um, and of course, when you go to int 4, um, the math gets cheaper, and so everything else becomes a little more expensive. Um, so let me, before wrapping up, just give my philosophy of, um, of accelerators in general. So at NVIDIA, for years, we've been building a platform for accelerators. It started out being a platform under which we plugged accelerators for raster graphics. We plugged in rasterizers and, and compositors and texture filters. Um, and then when deep learning became a, a big deal, we plugged in what we call tensor cores, which are basically matrix multiply units. And we decided we wanted to do ray tracing. We plugged in our T cores, which are tree traversal units. They basically walk a bounding, bounding volume hierarchy to find out what triangle this ray is going to hit next. And of course, they have the ray triangle intersection units in them. Um, and, and then most recently, we put in dynamic programming um, cores, which basically accelerate dynamic programming tasks like Smith-Waterman. Um, and my view of this is that the way we should think about designing both hardware and software is that we write a program. And the program specifies a behavior. And along with that program, we specify some mapping, which says where the behavior of that program takes place in time and space. And out of those two things um, come two things. One is code, basically say, where, where do we put these data and tasks? And the other is hardware blocks we need, that, gee, it would be really nice if this little piece of code would run faster than just running it on my usual integer and floating point units. And those become custom compute blocks that you um, basically, you know, hopefully get through the, the plan of record process for the next generation of GPU. <laughs> Someday, I hope we'll do these as chiplets so that you don't have to redo the whole GPU to add you know, your special accelerator for some problem that not that many people are interested in. Um, and, and our GPU is basically the balance of system, right? And, and, and this balance of system, uh, you know, uh, doing a null GPU, basically doing a GPU without adding a single line of RTL to the previous one, um, but taping it out in a new process technology, is probably a $500 million endeavor, right? So, you, you, so if I have some clever little dynamic programming thing I want to do, that's like two pages of Verilog, I don't want to have to spend $500 million to get that in there. What I'd like to do is take the platform, right? It's got an efficient on-chip network. It's got great regular programming units. It's got on-chip memory. It's got off-chip memory. It's got networks. It's got um, all sorts of interesting stuff I didn't have room for in this figure, and just drop my little two pages of RTL into it. And that would greatly reduce the barrier to entry of, of doing accelerators. So um, let me wrap up since I think I'm not yet to Berkeley Standard Time, but I'm getting close. No, Berkeley Standard Time is 50 minutes. <laughs> yeah. End on the time. Ah, I see. You're supposed to start late and end on time. Yeah, okay. there's 10 minutes to get to the next one. Okay. Well, this is Stan Stanford Standard Time. Then. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, just to you know, recap the talk, deep learning was, was really enabled by hardware. It was the spark that ignited the already existing algorithms and data sets and, and really enabled this revolution um, that's you know, transformed all aspects of our life in the last decade or so. Um, to, to fuel that, to sort of continue its progress, um, we have increased um, the uh, inference performance of GPUs by 1,000x over the last 10 years. This has come you know, largely due to number representation, also due to specialized instructions, and a little bit to process technology. Um, for the number representation, yeah, I walked through a bunch of things. I'm very enamored with logarithmic numbers. Um, it basically gives you the lowest worst case error um, for a given number of bits because the error is evenly divided out. And as I pointed out, even though adds are, are viewed as being hard in log number systems, you can factor out the hard part of the ad if you're doing a lot of ads. Um, and um, I talked about some recent results we had. Uh, so originally, we tried to do code book representations to put the symbols where they would do the most work. Um, that wound up being problematic because you eventually had to do operations. And that required a table lookup and then a very expensive high precision operation. We get much of the same gain. Uh, by doing optimal clipping. And we basically take the symbols, we put them where they do the most work just by compressing that range down uh, to fit onto the distribution we have. And there's a nice theoretical background to this where you're minimizing the mean squared error by balancing quantization error against clipping error. Um, you can do even better if you decide you're going to do this not over an entire layer of a neural network, but over relatively short vectors. So you take a vector of 32 or 64 elements, and the overhead of having a 4-bit scaling factor um, over those elements winds up being a few percent, but it gives you the equivalent of saving a couple bits per element in, in terms of the accuracy of the representation. Um, we've built a bunch of accelerators over the years. I think building these accelerators is important. It, it, it allows us to figure out where the real costs are, and, and often we think we have a great algorithm until we try to implement it in the accelerator. 
Um, I should say there, there are a bunch of approaches to sparsity that I didn't talk about that seemed great until we tried to put them into the accelerator. And we found out that glitching was killing us because when you're, you, you have one part of your circuit that's sort of looking at where the next non-zero is, and it's constantly updating the inputs to some multiplexer to select that guy out. In the meantime, the adder is getting fed everything that got intermediately selected from the multiplier, and your power goes through the roof. Um, and uh, we, we've discovered a lot of stuff, and these have been great test beds for what will ultimately go into a GPU core. Um, and um, you know, the, the accelerator I talked to you about at the end, um, the uh, magnet magnetic BERT accelerator that was described at, at the VLSI Circuit Symposium, is, is you know, 96, 95.6 teraops per watt on BERT with neg negligible loss of accuracy. And so I think that currently sets the bar for people who come up with you know, crazy schemes to compare against. I mean, what I always see is somebody says, oh, our thing is way better than a GPU. And I go, well, which GPU? Well, we're comparing to uh, Fermi. Um, well, you know, Fermi was 2009, thank you. Um, you need to compare to a recent GPU if you're gonna, if you're gonna compare, or better yet, um, com compare to uh, magnetic BERT. So I apologize for running a little bit over. I did not realize the Berkeley Time Conventions and I prepared an entire one hour long talk. Um, Okay, great. <laughs> we have time for a couple questions. Questions. Oh. Well, we have this. You can throw this. That's for this. you. And oh, that's a microphone. Me. Okay, I have two microphones. <laughs> Any questions from students, faculties? <laughs> oh, I see that's a, a, a soft <laughs> microphone, you can throw it, it won't bean people. Just, uh, talk to the microphone. This is a microphone? Yeah, this is microphone. just talking to this. Just Damn, to impressive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the question is, um, since um, you mentioned the benefits of uh, having a log number system, um, do you see that this being pushed as a standard, uh, you know, in, for machine learning and vector processing uh, uh, applications? And uh, given that, um, you know, NVIDIA and other companies are also pushing for an 8-bit uh, floating point standard, do you see them as, uh, you know, competitors? Um, so, um, you know, right now I'm just trying to get the product people to take this seriously. Um, <laughs> you know, it, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a foreign concept to them, and especially this, this cost of having to have multiple accumulators. There's a non-trivial cost to having to accumulate all eight of those bins. Um, separately, we have to demonstrate that the energy savings is large enough um, to justify that. So I think I think we still need to show feasibility and advantage before we get to the point of trying to make a standard out of it. Um, th to the second part of the question, um, the, the short answer is yes. I think I think that there's very much a competition between um, floating point formats and log formats because they're both trying to do the same thing. Um, they're both trying to make your error um, proportional to magnitude, um, and um, we have a lot more maturity around the logic needed to do floating point formats. So I think right now they're winning that competition just because people are very familiar with them. I'm optimistic that we'll eventually get logged to the point where it will do better. But because floating point is actually pretty good, it makes it harder for log to, to do better because floating point doesn't require that you have eight separate accumulators and it comes pretty close to that error of, of the log. So yeah, there's a competition. Thank you. Uh, you talked about integrating different uh, functionality or different uh, accelerators with different functionalities in the same GPU uh, under the same NOC, for example. Do you think there will be a point where you can flexibly choose what functionality to integrate into your GPU? For example, if you only need the rasterization core and the ray tracing stuff, you don't need the dynamic programming, do you think that could be done? Yes, yeah, this is a huge business discussion we have with every generation of GPUs because we have a bunch of different cores. We have, in fact, our FP64 is a separate core and not every one of our GPUs has FP64. Typically only our flagship GPU has, they all support the FP64 instructions, but the, the, to do it at full bandwidth, only the flagship you know, 100 series GPU has that. Um, and then we have all the graphics cores, the RT cores. Uh, not every GPU has RT cores, if you, if you look at our product line carefully. So we make a decision for every chip that tapes out what subset of cores are in there. Um, but you, you don't want to have too many variations because you know, the cost of um, doing one of these tape outs, it's very much what I said about the null tape out. It's a $500 million um, endeavor of which about $50 million is a mask set. Um, and, and so it's very often economically better to put in a bunch of cores that you know are only gonna be used by 10% of the customers. Look, all these graphics customers are not using those dynamic programming cores, at least not that I know of yet, uh, right? But they're carrying the tiny little bit of, of chip area for that 
because it would be prohibitively expensive to make a special chip just for people doing bioinformatics. Right? So, so it's, it's very much a, a business decision of weighing the cost of silicon area you're not going to use for a certain customer against the cost of the non-recurring engineering of taping out a chip without that silicon area. So I think a lot of what we've discussed today is around the lines of approximate computing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you think this is going to stay domain specific or there's uh, a possibility of this going general purpose? And how do you think we should study the idea of approximate computing? Well, I don't think this is approximate computing. It's approximate computing, as I understand it, is computing at energy levels where you wind up making errors on a regular basis and then somehow designing your computation to tolerate this. This is, I think, classical numerical analysis where you're trying to represent real numbers using you know, digital representations that have limit, limitations of dynamic range and precision. And I think we, we analyze it the way we always have by understanding what our errors are and how those errors accumulate. Uh, with the transformer engine that like dynamically checks what range tensors can be represented in, is did you guys do that because, you know, it's it's too hard to tell? Like it it, it makes it faster. It's faster than checking statically, or is that just like a usability thing? Like customers just don't like statically profiling. Well, you, you can't do it statically because the the activations change dynamically, and you could okay. do it using conventional instructions, but that would be slow enough that it would negate the gain of switching representations. Okay, okay. So that, that like, uh, occasional dynamic change is, like, valuable enough to, like, yeah, be worth yeah. it. Okay. It, okay. You know, for, for places where you can do it statically, people have already done it statically. Right. But it's where, it's where you can't statically prove that you can get by with the FP8. But if you scan the array, you'll know you can, and then, then it's worth doing. Right, and it scans yeah. the entire tensor? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, about the theme of, like, hard being easy and software being the real hard part. Uh, we see that a lot here as well, like there's a lot of skill gap between like the students that are, that are good at architectures and other students that are working on the compiler and programming languages mm -hmm. stuff. But what, do, what do you think should be the approach for grad students? Like, is it more like the architecture students has this to study harder on the compiler or had, uh, should there be more like collaborations between different students? Yeah. Well, I always think that the, that the most valuable researchers are people um, who, you know, you know, often referred to as tall, thin men, so that they, uh, span many air layers of the abstraction stack, and they can think you know, from the application level through the programming system and compiler level all the way down to you know, transistor level circuits. I think those people are just super valuable because very often the right optimizations get made by trading off things across levels. And if somebody is strictly a compiler person or strictly an architecture person or strictly a circuit person, they can't make those trade offs right? because they're working just at one level. Full stack. Full stack. Full stack. Yeah. Oh, God, no, that's